Hello, friends. Welcome again to another episode of Bigfoot for Breakfast. We appreciate that you're such a glutton for punishment, returning over and over again for your disturbingly delicious dose of creepy here at the home of the mysterious and the macabre, where we sit in the studio contemplating the mysteries of the universe and challenging conventional thought. We are your hosts, Sarah Jones and Samantha Carter. Make sure that you hit that subscribe button on your favorite podcast app and don't forget to leave a rating and a review. Because your thoughts, feelings, and opinions matter to us. Feel free, as always, to contact us on Facebook, Instagram, and the Twitter. And make sure you check out our website, BigfootForBreakfast.com, where you can find our merchandise store there as well. Those are just a few of the ways you can get to know us better, support us, or contact us. You can also send us an email at BigfootForBreakfast at Outlook.com, or you can always leave us a voicemail or text us at 641-812-2635. Don't worry, we don't answer if you call. That would be weird. I would love it if one day we could. Hello. Hey. <laughs> it would be really weird for them. It would be. They would not be expecting that. There's which no way I'm not going to make it awkward. Which is what we're all about. No guarantees. So we finally finished up our long Camelot saga, a four-part series tying together what still feels like just a small piece of the intricate Kennedy family mysteries and conspiracies. Let's be honest, man. That series was a little overwhelming and exhausting. So, let's move forward onto our next unsolved mystery case, which takes us to a place called Circleville, Ohio. The year is 1976, because I love to add in fun facts. Gerald Ford was president. A gallon of gas costs around 57 cents. A gallon of milk was less than two dollar. And the Vietnam War had just ended a year prior. But that's far, far away from the small American town where our story takes place, about 25 miles from Columbus, Ohio, settled along the banks of the Scioto River, sits the kind of small town where everyone knows everyone else. Or at least, they think they do. Oh, that's very ominous. At the time, there were about 13,000 people in the town of Circleville, which, I'm going to be honest, doesn't seem like a very small town to me. But that's neither here nor there. Among those 13,000 people, there were bound to be scandalous secrets lurking. There always are. That's a lot more people than where we live. Yeah, I think our town's at like 700. Because I was surprised. I thought we were at 900 because in 2010, we were. We're at like 750. Well, quit murdering people. We don't do that. Anyway, so in this year, in this town of Circleville, someone was intent on exposing those secrets. Their medium? Anonymous letters with a postmark from nearby Columbus, which contained what many would consider an alarming amount of personal details about the residents of this small Ohio town, the majority of which would be considered perverse or inappropriate. Of the many people in town among the multitude of secrets and the multitude of chilling anonymous letters, one in particular stands out, Mary Gillespie. Mary was a school bus driver. She was married with children. One day, in December of 1976, out of nowhere and for no particular reason, Mary became the target of the person known as the Circleville Writer, as that is how the letters were signed. The first letter that Mary Gillespie received was handwritten in large, all-caps, block letters, and made a shocking and serious accusation. The letter reads as follows. Stay away from Massey. Don't lie when questioned about knowing him. I know where you live. I've been observing your house and know you have children. This is no joke. Please take it serious. Everyone concerned has been notified and everything will be over soon. Like, what does that mean? That's very threatening. It is a little threatening. It kind of reminds me of The Watcher. The Watcher. It does. It's very similar to the Watcher episode. If y'all haven't heard the Watcher episode, very worth listening to. We should have hired that guy to read the letters. Oh, the guy that we had read the Watcher letters? He did a good job. He did. He was awesome. He was awesome. He had that, like, creeper, I'm gonna kill you voice. Yep. If we'd have thought ahead on this one, we'd have got him back. I want you back. It's worth noting that not all of the letters were scrolled in the same style of lettering either. There were others that were made much more sloppy. Apparently, this one was very organized looking. 
Well, the block letters. So these were written, I mean, written out, but this, it looks like, was written in all capital letters, like she said, big block letters. But someone had really taken the time to make it look nice and neat. Or to disguise their handwriting. Yeah. Looking at it, even the with the style of writing, I think it's a woman. Yeah, I think so too. Putting the primary subject of the letter aside, the contents of this letter are disturbing in so many ways. The fact of the letter implies that the writer actually knows Mary's life and her routine in a general sense. But the statement of knowing where she lives, watching her, watching her family, her children, violates on a very deep level the reasonable expectation of security and privacy within the walls of our own home that all people have and should be able to have. There's nothing about being watched in your most vulnerable and intimate moments in your safe place that brings comfort or a sense of security. Anyone who is raised in a small town knows all too well that there are no strangers. Everybody knows everybody, what they do, where they go, and that's hard enough. The person took small town knowledge to a whole new level with the most intimate details, the dirtiest secrets, and everyone was looking over their shoulders, afraid that they would be the next to receive a handwritten note that may change their lives for the worse. Dun, dun, dun. So, in reading this particular letter, I guess not knowing the people or the context, my mind wouldn't automatically assume the specific allegation. But this letter is perceived to be accusing Mary Gillespie of taking part in an extramarital affair with a man named Gordon Massey, who so happened to be the superintendent of the school. Not only did this writer make the allegation, he or she demanded that the affair end immediately, and also indicates that they have made this allegation known to others. But who? Why? Really, the biggest question, aside from the obvious who is the writer, is it true? The Circleville writer jumped in headfirst here, as you can imagine. Mary was terrified. She kept the letter a secret, sharing it with her husband, Ron, and no one else. One could assume... Haha, <laughs> you thought I was going to say surmise, didn't you? I'm surprised you did not. <laughs> one could assume that sharing this letter and the accusation contained within with her husband would indicate that she was not, in fact, guilty of said affair. Or perhaps she wanted it to seem that way. Or she wanted to confess before he got a letter of his own or heard it from someone else who had. After all, it did not sound like the writer was going to be keeping it quiet. Mary swore to Ron that the accusation was entirely without merit and she had not engaged in any form of a romantic relationship with Gordon Massey. I did not have sexual relations with that superintendent. <laughs> you said relations. Relations? There you go. You got it. Good job, buddy. Good job. So it wasn't long after Mary got her first letter. That's right. There are subsequent letters. Because we can't do an episode on one letter. That's absolutely asinine. There's got to be more. So then she received the subsequent letter. I believe it was about a week later or thereabouts. The content of the second letter was pretty similar to the first, and it added to her fear and paranoia. Mary became a little more vigilant in her day-to-day -day activities, keeping a discreet and fearful eye out in case the unknown stalker managed to slip up and make himself or herself visible. This does seem like a female thing to do. Females are more sneaky and catty. I feel like writing a letter behind people's backs and sending it anonymously would be a female. They're just petty like that. They're passive aggressive. Kind of like I feel like the watcher was an old lady. Could be. Even though we strongly portrayed it as a man. We really did. I mean, we got a guy to read the letters, so. <laughs> I just spilled coffee on my pants. Soon after Mary began receiving letters, making those accusations and demands, the writer clearly became frustrated with Mary's apparent lack of action because she just went about her everyday life. And her husband, Ron, then started to receive anonymous letters of his very own. Oh, goody. But it wasn't simply to tell him about his wife's alleged affair. The letter to Ron demanded that he admit the affair to the Westfall School Board. The writer threatened to kill him if he refused. The letter reads as follows. We must inform you, Mr. Massey. It's not to Mr. Massey. Oh, no, it's not. Ron... We must inform you that your wife is having an affair with Mr. Massey. She has chased him until he caught her. Eliminate them both before they eliminate you. Remember, 
We know where you work. We know your red and white truck. No one can help you. Think of your children and their future. Call the school board and report the truth after you finish your own investigation. Notify the school board immediately. Again, your life is in danger. Notice how it's now a we. Yeah, they're saying we. Implying, obviously, that there are more than one of them. Or they're like that guy on that movie, Top Hat. I don't know what movie that is. He's like the butler or whatever, and he refers to himself as we. I'm going to start doing that. That will really weird people out. (laughs) We regret to inform you. We're always trying to do weird shit. So, to walk back just a little bit, I'm thinking that perhaps Mary didn't actually talk to Ron after her original letter until he received one. So... I think from the research, some of the sources made it sound as though she told him immediately after she got her first letter, but then some of the sources made it sound like she came clean after she knew he got his letter. So maybe she just stressed about it internally, but went about her business like, maybe it'll just go away if I just keep my mouth shut, and then it did not. Yeah. At this point, they both know about each other's letters. And she says that, absolutely, I did not have an affair. So anyway, the letter addressed to Ron was also written in all caps in the block style lettering. Together, the couple continued to keep the letters and their content quiet, which, as you can imagine, further infuriated the writer. So two weeks after Ron received his letter, another one was sent, making the same demand, but with a new threat. And it reads as follows. Gillespie, you had two weeks and done nothing. Gillespie, Um, damn it. Well, you can tell that he's irritated. He wants action. So let me do my voice. Gillespie, you've had two weeks and done nothing. Make Mary admit the truth and inform the school board. Or I'll broadcast it on CBS, posters, signs, and billboards until the truth comes out. So there is another letter that appears to have some of the same wording written on it, but I can only find an image of the letter that has parts of it cut out. So it's like a zoomed in clip so you can't read the entire content. And it appears to be addressed to Defender, as in that's what he's titling the person he's writing to. Which sounds like it would be her husband, like he's not taking action. So he's the writer is assuming that he's defending her with his lack of action so it seems that mary and her husband both have chosen to kind of ignore it naturally just pissing him off and that partial letter begins with the phrase you are also a pig and you can see again where they were told to inform the school board or the information will be seen on cbs posters signs and billboards and then the snapshot of the letter, you can't read like the end of the sentences, but it ends with only pigs ride motorcycles. <laughs> like why? I only, don't know what that means. Only pigs ride motorcycles. At no point does it specify that Ron rides a motorcycle anywhere. Maybe the superintendent rides a motorcycle. I'd be looking real hard at the superintendent's wife. Is he married? Yes, and has a teenage son. <gasps> Which we discuss. Okay. My armchair detective keyboard investigator skills are starting to come out and once again that letter is written in all capital letters and block style lettering after we release the episode i'll post the images of what letters i could find okay they also they misspelled inform they spelled it inform i m f o r m so obviously he didn't go to this school anyway So by now, lots of people in Circleville are receiving these types of letters. They're all about different things, but they're all over the place. Mary Gillespie's and Ron Gillespie's were just kind of the most dramatic. And by this time also, the letters were inciting panic that was spread throughout the small town of Circleville, Ohio. Suspicions were high, but no one knew the author of these illicit and threatening letters. Ron and Mary decided to continue to try to keep things as quiet as possible But it seems like regardless of their wishes, word of the affair spread like whispered wildfire. Mary and Ron were in a tough and scary situation, and they needed help. They were limited on who they could turn to, because who could they trust? Not knowing who is behind the letters, they turned to their close family. Ron's sister Karen, her husband Paul Freshour, and Paul's sister. The group put their heads together to brainstorm and try to come up with a list of possible suspects. 
Mary expressed the feeling that she had that it may be a fellow bus driver who had come on to her that was behind the letters. She told the group that he had become angry when she shot down his advances, and it was decided that Paul would write a letter to this co-worker, and his name was David Longberry. The letter would tell him that they knew it was him and that he needs to stop doing what he is doing. Another lead that they followed was that a few of the letters were signed with the letter W, which led the group to consider the possibility that the writer may be William Massey, a.k.a. Bill, who was Gordon's own son. This does make sense. He definitely has motive. He may feel that it's his responsibility to protect his mother. Paul wrote three or four letters to William, prompting him to stop writing the threatening letters. When asked about writing the letters, Paul said, We thought we'd scare the guy. We'd send him four or five letters only. There was no violence in them or anything. Just that we knew who he was and what he was doing, and we sent him the letters. So he did confess to writing those four or five letters. You're listening to the Prescribed Films Podcast Network, home to hundreds of hours of free podcast entertainment. The shows on this network all have a common goal, providing you with the best discussions about movies and other forms of entertainment media. The PFPN hopes to fill your ear holes with audio joy. Visit our website with links to all the other amazing shows at www.thepfpn.com. Thanks for listening. Okay, so at this point, Mary and Ron have gone to family members, and now all the family members are kind of sitting around thinking about who could be doing it, and they've decided on the superintendent's son, William, and possibly... Okay, so they've decided on probably the superintendent's son, William, and they've decided to start sending him letters back. Oh, and also the bus driver that hit on her. So they're sending these people letters saying, hey, stop it. But they really have no proof that that's who it is. They are just thinking that maybe that's who it is. That's who would have motive. So perhaps it was just coincidence, but the letters did stop for a few weeks. But the peace can only last for so long. And once again, the letters began coming in. But it gets worse. Mary and Ron begin seeing signs posted around town. Signs making the claim that the superintendent who Mary had been accused of having an affair with, Gordon Massey, was romantically involved with the Gillespie's 12-year-old daughter, Tracy. Ron would drive around town early in the mornings in order to tear down the signs before Tracy or the other kids could see them. So now this guy's accusing both the 12-year-old daughter and Mary of having an affair with Gordon Massey. I feel like he's more out to get Gordon Massey in this situation. It seems that way. Yeah, like he's really running that guy down. So obviously this is a whole new level of violation. It's one thing to harass and stalk hapless town folk, but going after a child so aggressively and publicly is pretty shameless. One can only hope where the writer had been spot on with some of his accusations that he wasn't with this one. Out of nowhere, the story took an even darker turn. It was August 19th, 1977. The family was at home when the phone rang. Ron answered. Even today, the content of the phone call remains a mystery known only to those who participated in said conversation. But whoever it was, whatever they said, it absolutely infuriated Ron Gillespie. Even his wife Mary was unable to say what was said to Ron on that call. The only thing we are relatively sure of in regard to the call is that it seemed that when the call ended, Ron was pretty certain that he knew the identity of the mysterious letter writer. He told his family he was going to confront the writer. Ron grabbed his handgun and headed out the door and jumped into his pickup truck. You know, the red and white one that the guy said he was watching? At around 10.30 p.m., there was a motor vehicle accident that took place on Five Points Pike in Pickaway County. On that night, in Pickaway County alone, there were multiple accidents resulting in six drivers who were seriously injured and one dead. The one accident in particular, which is of interest to us regarding the story, a pickup truck was found wrapped around a tree. So at this point, either this was completely coincidental 
an accidental, or the writer of the letters, who presumably Ron now knew the identity of, had made good on his threat against Ron's life. So ultimately, Ron's death was ruled to have been a genuine accident. But of course, if this case was cut and dry, we wouldn't be here talking about it, would we? So let's discuss the facts which lead us to believe that there was probably a little more to this accident than the official ruling would suggest. First, the events leading up to the accident cannot be dismissed here. Ron and his wife had been stalked and threatened for months. Ron received a phone call that pissed him off thoroughly enough to cause him to grab a gun, jump in the truck, and take off after someone who he presumably believed to be the culprit. The gun was found in the vehicle. Upon investigation, it was shown to have been fired at least once. At who? No bullet holes were found inside the vehicle. No bullet was ever recovered from the wreckage. The truck, evidence in a death investigation, was sent to a crusher at the local junkyard and disposed of only days after the accident. The post-mortem examination showed that Ron's blood alcohol measured at one and one-half times the legal limit. Those closest to Ron attest to his dedicated abstinence from the consumption of alcohol. The mysterious writer began reaching out to several other residents with letters which seemed to be almost begging for a more thorough investigation into Ron's death to be conducted. So did he like want to get caught since he was reaching out to people asking for more investigation into Ron's death? At this point, we're kind of assuming that there might be more than one person writing letters. Okay. It seemed as though the author was entirely unsatisfied with the accident conclusion, either because he knew a different truth or he was pissed off that he wasn't getting credit for his work. The writer went so far as to send a letter accusing the sheriff, Dwight Radcliffe, of covering up the crime. Sheriffs would never do that. There was a couple of articles that I read that say the gun was destroyed before the investigation was over. Why is that always happening in every, uh, everything, in every like episode? In like true Kennedy investigation fashion. Like every episode. Remember like when the Smithsonian kept losing all their evidence with the giants and then every investigation we cover, it's like, oh, the gun's gone. Oh, so are these bullets. Oh, and so are John F. Kennedy's brains. Yep, everything. Everything's just gone. Poof. Um, that was only in a few of the articles, so I can't really confirm that. Okay. So I don't know for sure. I just wanted to throw that in there just in case. Well, it is applicable. Even Ron's brother-in-law, Paul Freshour, accused the sheriff of changing the story on his findings and in the investigation of Ron's death. Paul was quoted as saying, quote, The sheriff agreed with me that there was foul play, and then when I contacted him again, he had changed his attitude completely. Paul and Gordon Massey's wife went so far as trying to offer a reward for information leading to the arrest of the author of the obscene and threatening letters. But according to Paul in a later statement, they were told it would interfere with the sheriff's investigation. Now, remember, Paul was the one that wrote the letters accusing Gordon Massey's son and the other bus driver who hit on Mary. But my assumption is that Gordon Massey's wife probably wasn't aware of that and they probably weren't forthcoming about that information. But it is applicable later, though, that Paul Freshour got himself involved, correct? Yes. Okay. And he admitted to write some of the letters. He was writing the letters back, though, not the initial letters. Yes. Okay. Now, we understand that there are very few absolutes in a case like this, and it's possible that as the investigation went on, the lack of hard evidence and the fact that their only suspect, David Longberry, had passed a polygraph test led to the change in direction for the sheriff's opinion in the case. So the sheriff's office didn't consider the teenager, William, to be one, a suspect, but they did consider David Longberry, who was the bus driver that had hit on Mary. So they investigated him and gave him a polygraph that he passed. So that kind of eliminated their only suspect as far as law enforcement was concerned. So really, they just didn't know where to go from there. Yeah. So even if his personal opinion were that there was foul play in the accident, the official conclusion had to go where the evidence, or lack thereof, took them. So we'll give him fair consideration here, while keeping in mind that there was some sketchy things in the investigation, and it's still possible that for one reason or another, he covered up and destroyed evidence in a murder investigation. 
That wasn't the only investigation he was accused of botching, either. The writer of the letters accused the sheriff of mishandling an investigation into Pickaway County Coroner, Dr. Ray Carroll, who had been accused of sexual abuse by several children and was, in the end, actually charged with 12 counts of gross immorality, sex crimes, corruption of a minor, pornography, obscenity, indecent exposure in December of 1993. The point is, the letters were based on things that were legitimately happening. Eventually... With this continuation of the letters pouring into homes and hands of numerous Circleville residents, the situation escalated to the point of posters and signs being posted around town, most of which continued to focus on exposing Mary's alleged affair with Massey. Many of these signs were threatening not only to her and Massey's job stability, but Mary's children as well, most notably her 12-year-old daughter. So between the years of 1977 and 1983, the letter count that Mary had received was around 39 letters to Mary alone. And while Mary had been a clear primary target for the writer, like we said previously, she wasn't the only one receiving these letters. Within the same time frame from 1977 to 1983, the residents of Circleville had received letters which numbered into the thousands, so many that they had their own dedicated storeroom in the Pickaway County Police Station. So either this was more than one person or this was a very busy guy. In February of 1983, the writer's vendetta against Mary Gillespie had blown up into an entirely new level of intensity. While driving her bus route, Mary came across a sign which put her daughter in the line of fire with more accusations of an illicit relationship with Gordon Massey. Remember, this daughter is 12 years old. This is the last straw for Mary. And she stopped that bus, pulled right up by the sign, stormed out of the bus, and ran up to rip the sign down. However, as she got closer to the sign, she noticed something that struck her as strange. She noticed that there was a length of twine that was hanging from the crudely made box that the poster was hanging from. Instead of ripping the poster off the box, she packed the entire rigged up structure back onto the bus with her, where she proceeded to pry the lid of the box off. She managed to break the hold of the glue that held the thing together. Once she got the box open, she found two large blocks of styrofoam inside the box. The purpose of these blocks was to hold a pistol in place. It's a trap! The dangling twine that she noticed, which thankfully made her question how she was going to handle the package, was attached to the trigger. The writer had constructed this crudely built trap with the purpose of firing the gun at whoever tore down the sign. I really kind of question her logic at this point on bringing it into the bus where it is not specified if there are or aren't children on said bus. And if there were children on the bus, that would have put them at risk, obviously, as did pulling the bus over on the highway to begin with. Anyway, after that trap was found, another bus driver that had passed by the spot where the sign was found about 20 minutes before Mary did claimed that he saw a man standing near a yellow El Camino by the sign. Okay, so yellow El Camino now. The man turned away from the bus driver apparently trying to avoid being identified. That would have been around noon that day. So it sounds like Mary testified in court that she had first thought that the gun might have been a starter pistol and not a live firearm. Wouldn't it be obvious? Um, well, they look like revolvers most of the time, so I don't know if it was a revolver or if it was an automatic handgun that she found in the box. I don't know. Safety regulations have changed. Indeed. What I find strange about this whole piece of evidence is that rather than immediately report the incident to the police and turn in the evidence, she took the device home. It was only after having had it at her home for several hours that she finally took it to the police station. This makes me think she was having an affair with Gordon Massey because she was doing a lot of things to kind of like try to sweep the letters and the whole situation under the rug. You know what I'm saying? Am I like taking the armchair detective thing too far? I'm the worst. Even when I'm watching movies, I feel like I know the answer and everyone's like, shut up. Maybe we could all watch the movie together. Are you ready for this? Yeah, go ahead. An examination of the pistol revealed that it had belonged to Mary's own brother-in-law, Paul Freshour. I knew it. Aha. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So he worked at a local Anheuser-Busch plant. And a fun fact, apparently Paul was once a prison guard and had survived an intense 30-hour incident as a hostage when inmates briefly took over the Ohio State Penitentiary in August of 1968. So that's completely irrelevant, but an interesting fun fact about Paul, and I wanted to include it. So anyway, on to the literal smoking gun in the case, except not smoking because it didn't actually fire, but it sounded cool. 
Apparently, someone had tried to rub the serial number off the pistol, but lab tests were able to read it accurately. Fresh Hour said the gun was his, but he had not seen it in a long time and had no reason to check on it. He denied that he had anything to do with the booby trap. Unconvinced by Paul's argument, Sheriff Radcliffe asked Paul to take a handwriting test on February 25th of 1983. Good job. That's, that's the way to go. But it's not. Okay. So according to local journalist Martin Yant. 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 <laughs> it's just funny the way you said it. Yant. The writing test that was given to Paul was improperly administered as they actually required him to copy one of the Circleville writer's letters. This meant that the police had asked Paul to deliberately emulate the writer's penmanship while directly copying some of the letters. Even if experts were able to prove that the handwriting was his, the investigation was criticized for the incorrect manner administering the handwriting test in the first, and on top of that, Sheriff Radcliffe confirmed that no items, materials, or tools that were used in the construction of the booby trap. Booty trap? The booty trap. Attached to the sign were found at Paul's house or in his garage, including any ammunition for the gun that was found inside the booty trap. Did you know that booby trap spelled backwards is party boob? Oh, it is, isn't it? Yep. Following the improper test and the fruitless search of Paul's home and garage and... The fact that Fresh Hour supplied an alibi for the entire day that the booby trap was found. Paul Fresh Hour was still charged with attempted murder and arrested, which makes me feel kind of weird about the fact that Paul had been questioning the sheriff's work on the investigation early on. Things that make you say, hmm. It's at this point that I find it important to disclose Mary's sister-in-law, Karen, and Paul Freshour separated after Paul discovered that his wife was cheating on him. Paul filed for divorce, and it was in these proceedings and at no time before that Karen started to indicate that she believed Paul to be involved in the letters, the booby trap, and in Ron's murder. Also, around the time that the divorce proceedings were taking place, Karen had asked Paul's sister if she could use a typewriter that Paul had loaned to her because she was planning on writing a book. His sister questioned this a bit as she hadn't known Karen to be a typist or a writer, not to mention that she had found it odd, as do I, that she would want any of Paul's things since they were going through a divorce. Karen told her that Paul was aware and okay with her borrowing it, so she ended up loaning it to her. Now, I don't know about you, but I find it odd and mildly coincidental that in some of the letters that the people in Circleville had been receiving around that time were not written in typical block style handwriting, but typed with a typewriter. Weird. Yeah. During the divorce proceedings, Paul fought for and was awarded full custody of the couple's children, as well as their home. Karen Sorek, who is his ex-wife, moved out and ended up moving into a trailer which was sitting in Mary Gillespie's backyard. And that's enough to piss anyone off and drive them to do some crazy things. And you know, it's not that common for the wife to not get custody of the kids. And we always get the house. Absolutely. Right? (laughs) I mean, if not the children, definitely the house. Definitely the house. So anyway, the local journalist who was intensely invested in investigating this case, Martin Yant wrote to the parole board on Fresh Hour's behalf in 1993. What he had to say about Karen Sorek was this. In my 22 years as a journalist and investigator, I don't think I ever met an individual so consumed with such irrational hatred for another and willingness to say anything, no matter how provably false, to defame him. So now I think it's her. And the typewriter, you know? Yeah, and her attitude in life, period, sounds awful right? Which brings us to our next juicy tidbit of evidence that seems to have blatantly been ignored. The itsy bitsy teeny weeny yellow El Camino. We mentioned that Paul had an alibi. We mentioned that Paul didn't match the description of the person described by a witness who was out in the area of the booby trap that Paul was accused of setting before Mary found it. What we didn't specifically mention was that Paul did not own a yellow El Camino. And where would you come up with one of those? But I'm not going to let you down and say that we have no idea where the El Camino might come into play because there was a person indirectly related to the case that did own one. Karen Sorek's boyfriend's brother. So she had a boyfriend? She was cheating on him. Oh, yeah, that's right. I really got lost right there in that moment. 
So her boyfriend's brother, you know, the ex-wife who was so keen to defame her ex-husband and blame him for everything, the one who was also linked to the typewriter, which coincidentally became the medium by which the letters were being penned. Holy circumstantial evidence, Batman. I feel like that's even beyond circum- No, it's not, but it's so obvious. If these aren't grounds for reasonable doubt, I don't know what is. Also, I feel that it's important to note that during the trial, the El Camino was repeatedly described by the prosecution as having been orange, when the witness described it as yellow. Which leads us to believe that they were continuously trying to cover things up and make it look like it was Paul. But why? After Ron died and Gordon divorced his wife in 1979, Gordon Massey and Mary finally admitted that they had, in fact, been having an affair as the letters alleged. I knew it. However, they claimed that the affair only started after she began receiving the letters. No. There is no way to know for sure if Mary was telling the truth, but I think we can all agree that it is beyond strange that she would start sleeping with Massey after being warned not to, especially when threats against her daughter's life had been made. That doesn't sound like a very mother-like action to take, if you ask me, but of course, no one ever does. And also, I wasn't alive at the time. Wasn't it in the early 90s? No, I just said in 1979. I wasn't alive for half of the time. Anyway. Paul went to trial on October 24th, 1983 for the booby trap that had been set for Mary with the intention of murdering her. Although he was never charged with writing the letters, they were used against him at the trial and everyone assumed that he had written the Circleville letters. During the trial, there were only 39 handwritten letters available to be viewed as evidence, which seems strange considering the prosecution as well as the sheriff had notably repeated that there were thousands of letters in evidence. One could suspect that the letters were being withheld by the prosecuting attorney and possibly the sheriff as they had either shared information about them personally or information that may or may not have been detrimental to their case. More than that, Paul wasn't allowed to give testimony as a witness in his trial. As the trial judge, Judge William Ammer ruled that, quote, If Mr. Freshour took the stand, all thousand letters would be admissible as evidence. A recorded court transcript outlined that, Just prior to the start of the trial and in the presence of the court reporter, a hearing was held in the chambers on the issue of the admissibility of the letters the state intended to offer into evidence. At such time, the prosecutor advised the court that without the letters, he, the prosecutor, might as well just dismiss the indictment as he would then have a very shaky case, which he might not be able to prove. So they indicted him on the booby trap, but they didn't have enough to prove that he wrote the letters but they still used the letters that he may or may not have written as evidence to convict him in the booby trap. But I don't even understand how they had anything against him in the booby trap. Like, it wasn't his car. It he was didn't, his gun. But it didn't match the description. It wasn't his car. I mean, anybody could take someone's gun. I still think it's like the worst evidence ever that he was the person that did it. Even with the letters being used as evidence, the handwriting expert examining the documents written by Fresh Hour prior to the letters at no point was the poster that was placed on the booby trap for which he was being tried examined against Fresh Hour's handwriting by the expert. The expert that Fresh Hour said he never did even see or hear from in person. Private investigator Gene Laws testified at the trial that he had recently interviewed Connie Mangus and stated that she told someone from the sheriff's department that she saw a third party with Paul's gun the night before the alleged crime. It sounds like Mary Gillespie had been subpoenaed to appear at the trial as a witness, but she didn't honor that subpoena. Ultimately, Paul was still convicted of attempted murder for the trap and given the maximum sentence of 7 to 25 years. One would assume that the letters would stop filtering in once the culprit was in prison. Alas, this was not the case. Letters continued to be received, which annoyed the hell out of the sheriff who had charged Paul. He contacted the warden of Fresh Hour's prison to complain that he was still sending letters and Fresh Hour was placed in solitary confinement. There were investigations into how Paul was still sending letters from inside the prison, and at least three different sweeps of Paul's cell conducted in which nothing was found that would give any indication that Paul was writing and sending letters. After those investigations, the warden became convinced that Fresh Hour could not possibly be writing the letters. He even wrote in a letter to Paul's ex-wife Karen that he thought it was impossible for Paul to write the poison pen letters from his cell. Columbus, Ohio is where the letters were postmarked 
and presumably sent from, and Paul was in Lima, Ohio, which was 90 miles away from there. And he was in prison, so it's not like he could go there. Paul was denied parole after seven years of imprisonment, in spite of having been a model inmate, due to the large number of letters that were still being sent. This new batch of letters featured more horrific allegations. In one, the Circleville writer accused Roger Klein, who had prosecuted Paul Freshour, of having killed a pregnant school teacher. Jeez, get real. The writer threatened to dig up the victim's grave and mail the bones to the police unless Klein admitted to impregnating the woman and killing both her and the unborn child. Following an investigation carried out by Ohio TV station, a local family confirmed the rumors that prosecutor Roger Klein had in fact gotten a school teacher pregnant and was further investigated, but eventually he was cleared. He eventually moved on in his career, becoming an appellate court judge and retired in 2013. As far as we're aware, there were no bones mailed to the police in this case. Thank God. These letters really pulled no punches in their accusations at all, did they? Also, while he was incarcerated, Paul received a letter with the perceived intention of mocking him and his circumstances. This letter stated, quote, Now when are you going to believe you aren't going to get out of there? I told you two years ago, when we set them up, they stay set up. Don't you listen at all? End quote. In fact, Paul received multiple letters while he was imprisoned, and an excerpt from one of those other letters reads, quote, Shame how things work out, but better you than me. The sheriff says you did it, but we know better, don't we? End quote. That one's even rhymey. If you ask me, that's sending a pretty clear message, and that message does not give me a stronger indication of Paul's guilt. How about you? After 10 years of imprisonment, Paul Freshour was finally granted parole in May 1994. Paul wrote a 164-page document for the FBI asking them to investigate elements of his case. The cover page of this document states this, Dear FBI, I am asking that you get involved in my former brother-in-law's murder because I believe that it was a murder and covered up by the sheriff of Pickaway County. Here in the state of Ohio, please review the following exhibits, especially where they are highlighted. Please see exhibits C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, and N. This confirms something is wrong. I realize that the FBI is busy. However, if someone will just take a few minutes to read and confirm the enclosed, you will learn something is not right for yourself. The sheriff is Dwight Radcliffe, Pickaway County, Circleville, Ohio, 43113. I was sent to prison because a series of obscene and threatening letters that had the county in panic. I did 10 years and the letters continued undisturbed and uninterrupted just as always. I believe the majority of the obscene, threatening, and dangerous letters were true. I am asking that the letters also be investigated and cleared up completely. Sincerely, Paul Larry Freshour. In this document, and bear with me because I know it's a lot, there is a list of the letters claims which Paul asked to be further investigated. Paul's lists of facts are these. I believe that the obscene, threatening, and dangerous letters were concealed because they would interfere with Sheriff Radcliffe becoming the National Sheriff's Association's president. See the date of the letters and the date of his involvement with the National Sheriff's Association. The crime rate in Pickaway County at that time would have eliminated him from this appointment. No one has ever been indicted or charged with the obscene, threatening, and dangerous letters, which often contained arsenic poison. I didn't ever read about that in anywhere except for his letter to the FBI. Okay, so only Paul has said that, that it, they contained arsenic. No other source did, right? No, not that I could find. Okay. I believe every letter constituted an attempted murder charge, yet no charge or indictments were ever made. They have had 26 years to solve this crime. Hopefully you can get the letter crime solved. The Department of Corrections confirmed for the 10 years that I was in prison under strict investigations that I was completely cleared of the obscene and threatening letters. See Departments of Corrections for the state of Ohio. Sheriff Radcliffe lied in the media and claimed that he caught many people smuggling letters for me. Please confirm this was a lie. Confirm the obscene, threatening, and dangerous letters claimed a prosecutor had a school teacher pregnant and murdered because it would destroy his law enforcement career that he worked hard to achieve. 
He completed law school and then went on as an attorney, a prosecutor, judge, and now an appeals court judge. This murder has never been solved. I'm sure it will never be if the obscene, threatening, dangerous letters are true because Judge Klein had too much power and protection from our legal system here in Ohio. All the forensic evidence was denied being given to me, and this should be confirmed in question. Why? Please see everything concerning my former brother-in-law. Confirm that Sheriff Radcliffe kept the school superintendent's divorce out of the media because it might have affected him because of the rumors of his affair with a school employee which had been reported in the obscene and threatening letters. Through investigation, the sheriff was going to claim that this was done in order to catch the letter writer. Who was going to call and question why Massey's divorce was never in the media? The sheriff always covered his tracks. Please review all materials and send someone to investigate my claims, which are true. I feel like Paul's claims are fair. He also made the claim that Gordon and Mary would go to his hometown, Gallipolis, Ohio, and had a stopping point halfway there to have a drink at a bar, which was Gordon's friend's bar. Mary also met Gordon at different places, even in West Virginia, once she met him outside of Cincinnati, and in fact ran out of gas in her car and her husband had to come get her. Paul wrote to the FBI that, quote, On the night of Ron's murder, Mary Gillespie and my wife, Karen Sorek, were on their way to Florida with two other women. These women will swear in court of law that they were told Gordon Massey would be there. They informed my lawyer of this. A year prior to Paul's release, the television program Unsolved Mysteries decided to feature this mystery of the Circleville writer. Before the episode could be filmed, the show received a threatening card that read, Forget Circleville, Ohio. Do nothing to hurt Sheriff Radcliffe. If you come to Ohio, you sickos will pay. L sickos. In spite of the threats made in relation to the filming of their show, the Unsolved Mysteries team went ahead with their production. The episode debuted on November 11th of 1994, but unfortunately bore little fruit in the way of finding or exposing new leads after it aired. The 1993 warning to the show was the last known incident in regard to the Circle of a Rider. For the most part, it seems that the letters were kept pretty close to the sheriff's vest, and very few of them are available to be viewed by the public for one reason or another. I do suggest that if you are wanting to do some digging of your own into this case, you find the link for Paul's letter to the FBI and look through it. Aside from that, I think you somewhat get the gist of the saga that is the Circleville Letters. And that's that for this week's episode of Bigfoot for Breakfast. Thank you again for following us down the rabbit hole. Keep listening as we continue to spiral down through various mysteries of the universe. But before I forget to go along with this episode, the Circleville Pumpkin Show, which is an annual event, should definitely be added to our list of tour straps to visit in the future. Ohio, here we come. I don't want to go to Ohio. But my heart is in Ohio. Mine is not Hawthorne Heights. Apparently, they also have a water tower that's painted like a pumpkin. Ohio versus everything. O-V-E. I don't even know what you're talking about. Wrestling Revolver. Oh, I don't watch that. Wrestling Revolver. Nobody likes wrestling. I do. I know. But I do. Anyway, if uh, you happen to go to Ohio to see some pumpkin shows, send us pictures. Yeah, or if you're from there. Yeah, if you're from there. Are you from that area? Are you from Circleville? Send us a picture of that pumpkin, that pumpkin water tower. And any other information that we may not have been able to find about the letters that circulates around. Yes, instead of leaving a mean review because you're from the area, just tell us the other information and we will update our episode. I tried really hard to find it. Yeah, and sometimes sources seem believable and then they turn out to be friggin' wrong. So... If you know anything that's different from anything we ever say, just tell us that. We'll update. We're not against the truth. Anyway, if you want to contact us for any reason, shoot us an email at bigfootforbreakfast@outlook.com. Send us a Facebook message or post on our wall. You can share memes with us. We love those. You can also follow us on Instagram. Send us messages on there. And don't forget about Twitter. <laughs> also, you can leave us a voicemail and let us know what you think of the show and we'll play it on an episode. The number is 641-812-2635. And also, I want to give a quick shout out and say hello to Sam from Old Barn Taxidermy. Thanks for listening and make sure you check them out on Facebook. She's literally waving at you while she says it. Hi, Sam. Hey. I love your name. See you next week. 
Ta ta. Come at me, bro.